Good evening and welcome to Cambridge Forum. I'm very glad to see so many of you here tonight, not at home finishing up your taxes, um, but participating in the kind of free and open discussion that Cambridge Forum has been presenting for 41 years. Can you believe it? We've been doing this for 41 years. I'm Pat Zerke. I'm the director of the forum, and it, I am delighted that you're all here tonight as we host author Kevin Phillips discussing his newest book, Bad Money, The Global Crisis of American Capitalism. The title of the book is a little bit longer than that. The exact title is Bad Money, Reckless Finance, Failed Politics, and the Global Crisis of American Capitalism. Our forum is moderated tonight by Richard Parker, who is a lecturer in public policy and senior fellow at the Shorenstein Center at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. An economist by training, he is the author most recently of the intellectual biography, John Kenneth Galbraith, The Making of American Economics. His articles have appeared in numerous professional and mainstream journals, including the New York Times, The New Republic, The Nation, Harper's, Le Monde, Atlantic Monthly, and International Economy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Richard Parker from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and welcome to the Cambridge Forum. The author uh, tonight, Kevin Phillips, is uh, discussing his latest book, Bad Money, and the perilous future that reckless finance has created for American influence in the global economy, certainly, but also in the world of international relations. Subprime lending, the housing bubble, a falling dollar, imploding credit markets, just how bad is the American financial situation? Kevin Phillips in this latest book argues that every aspect of American life, from political campaigns to regulatory legislation, from the cost of oil to the cost of food, has been put at risk by what he calls the bad money that has come to dominate the US GDP. How did this bad money come to drive out good money in the American economy? How can the nation extricate itself from its, coming, uh, from its current financial crisis? How painful would the current uh, correction be for individual citizens and for a nation that finds itself dependent on rather than driving the global economy? Kevin Phillips began his career as a Republican political strategist helping to design the party's famous Southern strategy of winning over uh, lifelong Democrats to Republican loyalties. His 1969 book, The Emerging Ma Republican Majority, inaugurated his career as a successful political and economic commentator through 13 more books in the next three decades. But while his analytic acuity and verbal mastery remain unaltered in that time, his political outlook has changed dramatically. Recent books, including the New York Times bestsellers American Dynasty and American Theocracy, have been sharply critical of the current state of American politics and policy, uh, and not alone those of the Republicans' Democratic opponents. His newest book, Bad Money, Reckless Finance, Failed Politics, and the Global Crisis of American Capitalism, extends that analysis of domestic policy failures to the global arena. Welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Kevin Phillips. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I find myself in, uh, always at the beginning of a book tour. The first place I give the speech to uh, it becomes kind of a test audience uh, in the sense that after I, I do it, I ask myself, well, did you get this part out? Did you set the right framework up? Did people get the sort of questions they should be asking and so forth and so on? Uh, I think that this situation that we're in, unfortunately, is a very, very important and perilous one. Uh, the, the history of leading world economic powers is the inability to really pursue and debate these questions. And as a result, countries continue to indulge the sense that we're different. We don't have to worry about this. We're unique, it can't happen here, but all these countries, the predecessors, 
have felt this way. And what I'll really get into here will be the history of the growth of finance in the United States in a way that suggests it's sort of a dangerous aberration and that it doesn't reflect a normal growth but a sort of end of the national trajectory degree of extreme behavior. And that what we're seeing here is perilous to the, the future, not simply of the United States, but the credibility of the Anglo-Saxon, which is the more speculative variety of capitalism. And that if it turns out that, that what we're doing is as is, is trouble prone as, as I think it probably will be, I think it will enable the, uh, the speeding up of, of the Asian century, which is probably coming. Now, if you go back and you look at the history of the United States and of Britain and of the Dutch, who were the maritime global power when New York was New Amsterdam, there's a continuum there. These countries were close. They emerged out of one another, either politically or in some ways financially, as, as the British did from Holland. Uh, this time, it's not going to be that sort of sequence. If there's a transition, it's a more substantial one. I also don't think that there's any likelihood of repeating any major American trauma like the Depression. It's probably not a relevant analogy here. Uh, I think it's, if we have our problems, it's likely to be more in the neighborhood of the, uh, the 1970s when the real damage that was done was camouflaged by inflation and people never got the sense of things having declined as much as they did in a lot of ways. Well, let me go through this because it's a portraiture, uh, you know, whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I can assure you basically that the media do not want to discuss all this. Uh, there's no interest in discussing it. The average person would rather not know about it. The percentage of Americans who would rather know about it are, are probably, uh, you know, maybe max five or 10 percent. Uh, we're going to have a lot of problems from it, but we'll come out after 25 or 30 years the way the other countries did, stripped down, lost in terms of a number of these leadership roles, but they're not all that much of a benefit at this point anyway. So let me start by going through the rise of finance in the United States, which is a very, very momentous thing that has escaped serious analysis. But if you look at the current GDP data, you will see that as of the, the most recent four or five years, finance has represented between financial services between 20 and 21 percent of the gross domestic product. There is a sense that is used in the press and by some of the financial spokesmen, they talk about problems in finance haven't spread into the real economy. You'll have seen that phrase. Uh-uh. Finance is the real economy. Finance is the power center. Finance has gotten that inroad into the GDP because of a major growth pattern, which is actually pretty easy to document. It's, it's the implications of it that nobody wants to discuss. If you accept the notion that all of a sudden you've got a new center of gravity in the economy, and the center of gravity is misbehaving, and it's infecting money market funds, and it's drying up student loans, and it's doing a number of other things, well, you'd like to think it was just some periphery. Unfortunately, it's not. If you go back to, let's say, 1970, when you have finance beginning to become important because computers are making possible all sorts of mathematical approaches to new financial instruments, you have the, uh, the federal government shutting what they call the gold window, not allowing central banks to redeem their uh, foreign currency, their dollars for, uh, for gold. Uh, and then you have the, uh, the rise of all sorts of uh, computer capacity beyond that to take the math and invent things you can do, which are very nice for uh, making money based on programs and all sorts of mathematical adventures. Well, all of this comes at a very important time because the 70s are really the takeoff decade and the 80s are the more important 
uh, real launching decade of the financialization of the United States. But if you go back to 1970 and you look at the current data at that time, because it has changed, and when they change things in this country, they backdate the statistical changes so that the same calculation is used to redo the calculations at the time. But if you go back to the uh, finance, insurance, and real estate, which is the financial side of real estate sector, in the early 1970s, you're looking at about 12% of GDP. And at that point, uh, manufacturing was up between 25 and 27%. And most people had some sense of that. They had the sense manufacturing was the dominant part of the private economy. Finance you didn't think about as being a major thing. I mean, it was important, but it wasn't a dominant part of the economy. We had these nice, well-behaved neighborhood banks where you knew the tellers and where if you had a mortgage, you didn't have to you know, check every last little game in it. And if they issued you a credit card, it didn't have five pages of conditions that came with it at the time. Uh, it was a very different system. It was just pretty tame, relatively speaking. And manufacturing dominated the economy. And that spread jobs around so that the, the well-off portion of the labor movement became middle class. You had uh, you know, 25, 30 million jobs connected to manufacturing, more or less at its peak. And the number of high paying jobs that move people out of an existing economic class in finance you know, it's, it's under a million. Uh, the, a lot of the support, prof, you can't call them professions, the supporting clerical and procedural and information technology workers, at first they were in Maine and South Dakota, and then they were in Ireland, now more are in India. Uh, it, it's not a high hiring set of, of industries and sectors. But all of a sudden we have is 20 to 21 percent of GDP. Now what I'll try to convey is exactly what they started to become that added on that last four or five percentage points. And this is really the crux of the matter. But if you look at the rise of debt in the United States, you see that that bears a very close relation to the rise of the financial sector because one of the biggest products you get out of the financial sector is debt and credit. And it obviously plays a role when a lot of Americans are not living quite as well on the incomes they used to have as they would like to. And the whole consumer society creates this demand and people borrow money. So the borrowing of money in the United States has become an ever-growing business. The Wall Street Journal recently had on one of its back pages a little column that referred to the debt industry. The debt industry is a very major industry in this country, whether you think of mortgage finance or you think of credit cards, which were deregulated in the 1990s and in this decade, so that basically they, they can do almost anything they want with interest rates and fees and what have you. Now, it's become enormously lucrative. The, the big growth period of finance in terms of this ballooning of its role started in the late 1980s. And this was essentially under the Reagan administration. And everybody remembers the, the SNLs, the savings and loans that were deregulated and allowed to do almost anything they wanted. And uh, they got into all sorts of uh, crazy situations. Most of it was with real estate, but by no means all. There a number of junk bonds came into play. And the financial sector made a major surge in the late 1980s. But the other thing that was happening, when you, you think of the rise of finance, you have to think of two, two words, bubble and bail. <laughs> now, the bubbling is that essentially, as all this was taking place, you had an enormous amount of debt creation and a lot of liquidity. Uh, things were made easier for the financial sector in terms of uh, raising money, borrowing money. Uh, at certain points, interest rates would be pushed way down to keep companies that were in trouble, banks that were in trouble, from imploding. Uh, and that's sort of the, the bubbling side by the 1990s. I'll go through, believe me, the statistics on this, the, the 45 to 60 seconds worth, are not boring. They're stunning. <laughs> 
because most people have no sense of how much debt has been created. It's not government debt, it's private debt. And this is the way all the money was put together so that you could leverage finance from a, a fairly you know, low-keyed game to where they were leveraging up uh, you know, 1,500%, 3,000% to make serious returns out of movements of an eighth of a point or a sixteenth of a point. And when all the money that was borrowed, part of it went to that, part of it went to giving uh, people involved in the mortgage business uh, enough of a float so that they could uh, give you a wonderful mortgage that you could sort of decide how much you wanted to pay for the first couple of years. It was all very nice, all very civilized. Set your own payment. You know, it wouldn't balloon for a little while. You had to have some resources to do this. But then, of course, two years out or two and a half years out, it became like one of these bear traps where all of a sudden all kinds of things change and there were all these new forms of mortgages. And one of Alan Greenspan's greatest vulnerabilities, he didn't lift one finger to curb any of this. And he knows it. Uh, he's certainly not the only one, but he didn't lift any fingers. So you saw all of this building up because of the bubbling of the economy with liquidity being created by the Federal Reserve and with debt being facilitated. Now, the other thing they did, and I won't try to go through them, but I've got a whole page in the book that lists all the different bailouts without any particularly detailed description, just sort of little headings, uh, relentless. And they started in the early 1980s bailing out the, uh, the Latin American bonds, and they went to SNLs, then they went to some banks that were failing because of uh, real estate. Uh, the Citigroup, you know, they want to be bailed out again now. They were bailed out back in 1991. I mean, this is the closest thing to a scofflaw bank that exists in the United States. <laughs> and I want to say that for the cameras, and Bob Rubin, you're free to sue me. <laughs> I don't expect it, but you're free to do it. Uh, the incredible pattern of bailouts. Then you got into the, the 1990s, and the SNLs gave way to the, the Mexican peso bonds, and then it was the Asian currency crisis, then the Russian debt crisis, then it was Y2K. You know, and then it was they had to create the housing bubble to replace the high-tech bubble, and so forth and so on. So you're getting bailouts and you're getting liquidity. Now, the thing that makes this such striking reading is most of you probably have the sense from, you know, things you've read and heard that the, the greatest danger in terms of debt in the U.S. economy isn't the, uh, rather, is really the budget deficit, the extent to which the federal government has borrowed all kinds of money, and we're in hock accordingly. Well, let me read, this is the growth of total U.S. financial and non-financial debt, and I can do this very quickly. 1974, it was 2.4 trillion, 1984, it was 7.4 trillion, 1994, it was 17.2 trillion, 2004, it was 37.6 trillion, 2006, 44.7 trillion, closing in on $50 trillion right now, up from 2.4 trillion in 1974. So that's a measure of how what they call credit market debt in the United States has grown. Now, the growth between, let's say, 1984 and 2006 for the federal government, it's up from 1.3 trillion to 4.9 trillion. But let me tell you what domestic financial debt, this is the borrowing of the financial sector. 1984, it was 1.1 trillion. 1994, it was 3.8 trillion. 2004, it was 11.9 trillion. 2006, it was 14.2 trillion. Now, you want to know where they got the money that they could afford to give you these little sweetheart exotic mortgages that ballooned after two and a half years and surprised everybody? Well, they raised a lot of money. A lot of debt was issued. A lot of money was borrowed so the hedge funds could, could leverage uh, 300 or 3,000 percent off what, what they gambled on.
Regulations tended to be scrapped because the government was bailing out. It wasn't causing trouble. There wasn't any desire to regulate these people. They got rid of the Glass-Steagall Act, which was the, the old uh, 1930s legislation that basically blocked uh, depository banks from getting involved in investments or insurance or any of that. You just got rid of it in 1999. Uh, the Federal Reserve had effectively suspended it before Congress decided to get rid of it. They deregulated credit card fees and interest rates in the 90s and then early in, in this decade. So that essentially almost anything went. Now, this sounds extreme, but it's, it's awfully easy to document. Both parties were involved in this. The Republicans can't say the Democrats did it, and the Democrats can't say the Republicans did it, although the Democrats are more inclined to say this because not enough people understand what went on during the late 1990s. But you get these staggering amounts of money that were, this is what I call the triumph of leverage. This is just the... Financial sector's share of outstanding debt of all sectors. 1989, it was 19%. By 2006, they had a 32% share. I mean, this is of everything. And you're feeding this monster, the, the financial sector, so that it can do all kinds of things that essentially aggrandizes it. Uh, aggrandizes it because the huge growth of mortgage finance, the huge growth of credit cards and what could be charged for them. You know, as the bank is paying you two and a quarter percent and if you're late on your credit card, it's 24 percent. Not a very obvious balance there. Something's a little off key. Uh, you know, William Jennings Bryan came back to uh, give a speech. He wouldn't need to talk about the cross of gold. He could talk about the uh, credit card fees. Uh, crucifying probably a higher ratio of people than, than ever got nailed by the gold standard. Uh, but all of this, I mean, it sounds technical. It's not technical. This is the rise of a sector that replaced manufacturing in the United States as the mainstay of the economy. And only in the last five, six, seven years has it been free to metastasize in a, uh, a very difficult way. The first is that everybody wanted economic stimulus after 9-11, so it became patriotic to refinance your house, to borrow money. Uh, George Bush, George W. appeared in a commercial for uh, uh, travel industry about how everybody should fly and move around. <laughs> he didn't appear in a commercial for a credit card industry, but They've been very friendly to his campaigns. Basically what you have is this industry that expanded itself from the 15, 16% of GDP level up to the between 20 and 21% with mortgage finance, with credit cards, with all kinds of fees and all kinds of directions with what they call securitization. Securitization is if you take a whole bunch of mortgages or, or other asset uh, uh, loans and you pull them together and, and you make them, you take 1,500 or 2,000 and you package them and you sell them to the you know, Second National Bank of uh, Southwestern Schleswig-Holstein or something like that where they're not terribly smart and they'll buy all this crap because it's got a uh, AAA rating, which is, you know, another little sign of the times. And nobody could explain what these things were. These are CDOs, collateralized debt obligations. This is what Alan Greenspan said about them. I always enjoyed this quote because you know, he realizes he's a little bit on the hook for a lot of this stuff, so he doesn't want to be held responsible for a lot of parts of it. And let me just get this. This is Alan Greenspan. Needless to say, he was the chairman of the Fed when all of this stuff was taking shape, but, you know, that's another story. Collateralized debt obligations have gotten much too sophisticated, are priced by extraordinary mathematical models, and are very difficult to value. I think people are going to be frightened to deal with these things for a long time. A lot of them are just going to disappear because they've been tried. They don't work. 
Well, by the time they weren't working, there were about, uh, I don't know, seven or, or eight hundred billion dollars worth of them out there. So you wonder why a lot of these banks are finding that this, you know, thinly disguised financial toilet paper isn't working out too well. Uh, it now turns out that somebody like Greenspan, you know, really knew that nobody understood them. And of course, people that ran the big financial firms, uh, they didn't understand them either. They had some kid who was a mathematical whiz would come in and explain and they didn't know really what he was talking about. But they paid terrific fees. So one of the big games that developed that finance fed like a, a piranha fish off was not only did it pay to put out a lot of game mortgages with exotic terms that you could pull in people who couldn't afford to buy the houses, and that's the sort of person you had to pull in because most of the people who could afford them had already bought them. So if you want to come up with a big business in mortgages, you've sort of got to go out of the realm of, of the people who were familiar with the general subject matter and could afford them. Now, once you had created this mortgage, which had, let's say, all kinds of gimmicks in it that you didn't have to pay anything until you decided you wanted to and so forth, and that that was going to balloon at a certain point and cause trouble, uh, just so you didn't have to be around when it caused trouble, you could sell it to the people who securitized it so that they could put 1,500 of them together to sell to the Second National Bank of Schleswig-Holstein, which presumably had no more idea of what was in them than the salesman who represented Merrill Lynch. Uh, now, all of this stuff was part of what was developing along with all the interest rates they could charge and the fees they could charge on credit cards. And three bucks at the ATM now it is in Manhattan, I was amazed to find yesterday. Uh, the progress from $1.50 to three bucks has been incredible. And of course we have no inflation in this country because we have great statistics. You know, and they say that you've got a 2% core inflation. What's well, too bad there isn't any just core inflation anywhere else in the world. There's this galloping commodities inflation, but that doesn't bother Chairman Bannon, you know, his whirling blades of his helicopter club. <laughs> you know, they, they don't want to admit that inflation is really so high that you're getting really stuck when you can only get 2% from a bank. If you had to admit that inflation is 7%, you could only get 2% from a bank, well, then something's wrong. But of course, all kinds of people overseas have figured this out. So what you've got, what rolled around in, in 2007, was you had this huge structure of debt and credit that had been built up, and that had basically allowed finance to invent all these new things. Some of you, well, I'm sure most of you probably have heard of a derivative. You probably couldn't describe them. But you know, some of them are real and some of them are fanciful. Some of them have only notional value. The credit default swaps, which are now beginning to go sour, nobody knows exactly what the real value of them is because there are counterparties that cancel each other out in terms of the liability. But the notional value is like $500 trillion is out there. And now at this point, some of the great swamis are figuring, you know, some of this is going to come home to roost. So Bill Gross, who's a big bond manager out in California, now figures that $250 billion or $300 billion of the credit default swaps are going to go sour too. So the International Monetary Fund a couple of days back thought it was highly likely that the failures on these dimensions would reach up towards a trillion dollars. Now, if you listen to the experts, they say that because the, the Fed has stimulated the economy, things are going to be getting better in the fall. I doubt it. <clears throat> and one of the reasons I doubt it, and this puts me into the last visible picture that I think is important. I don't think anybody can really see this, but what you've got, if you look at a portrait of debt in the United States as a percentage of gross domestic product, you see that if you look at the 1920s and into the 1930s when a lot of people were trapped in debt, 
you have debt getting as high as, let's see, what was its peak? Its peak was 287% of gross domestic product was debt. Now we get to the 1980s and it starts rising again. And it rises so that in 2000 it's up to 269%. 2004 it's up to 304 percent, 2006 up to 335 to 340 percent. In other words, the debt is that ratio bigger than the GDP of the United States. Now when you see some of this flim flam starting to go south, you have to have some idea of what an amazing debt structure we have and how little the discussion of it has been. And I read the numbers that the federal debt is peanuts compared to this private debt that's out there. Now, Americans are gonna to have to start cutting back. There's no way that, that we can take on much more debt. It's getting expensive to do so. Uh, for an awful, an awful lot of people who used to think you could avoid debt in bankruptcy, they reformed the bankruptcy laws several years back and effectively there isn't any uh, egress that way the way there used to be. You can't escape it. Uh, what happens over the next three or four years, I wouldn't try to predict, but I think we're gonna have housing prices that go down nationally between about 10% and 20% this year. Now those are staggering numbers, and if you look at that as a percentage of the housing wealth in the United States, if it did go down that much, you'd be looking at something in the neighborhood of four or five trillion dollars. Now, how much you can achieve by pumping stimulus in that affects the amount of money that's out there by you know, only a tenth as much as, as that kind of number. This is why you saw the headlines in the last couple of days, the forfeitures and foreclosure rates are just soaring because people realize that they've got a $280,000 mortgage on a house that's only worth 245 or 210, so walk away. Well, at a certain point, when that's happening the way it seems to be happening, enough people are gonna be hit by that that how are you gonna get rid of this huge backlog of homes that has been built up? There's certain parts of certain cities where there's still an awful lot of money and it doesn't seem to be affecting it that much. But you have this huge debt level that's been built up over 25 years, and most of it's been since 1984. I mean, Alan Greenspan presided personally over a quadrupling of the size of total credit market debt in the United States. And old Clinton, who talked about how we balance the budget, he sure let the pumps go on the rest of it. Uh, so they're all in there. I mean, I started out life as a Republican. At this point, they all hate me, I figure. You know. um, they all did it. You, know, you don't have to be Agatha Christie to figure this one out. You know. 25 years, whichever party was in there, where they were pumping something up and bailing something out. And how do we deal with this and how do we keep it from imploding? It is something resembling the degree that things imploded back in the, the 1930s. Well, I don't think you can avoid it just by cutting rates. Uh, if you remember back in 2001, Greenspan cut rates quite a bit and you didn't really see any effect from that until at the earliest, late 2002. So how they're gonna get all this effect coming by September or October, I really don't see. The other difficulty is people are stopping consumption. They're, they're scared. The uh, consumer indexes are down to the lowest level, one of the consumer surveys, since 1982. The forecast for housing price declines are for the steepest since the 1930s you're now starting to get various financial people talking about the biggest financial crisis since either World War II or the 1930s. And since World War II wasn't a financial crisis, you know, forget that one, <laughs> because you've got to go back to the 1930s. Now, how seriously should you take all of this? I think you should take it very seriously. And you ask me, well, you know, who cares what you think? Uh, a lot of people would say, exactly, who cares what he thinks? The difficulty is that if you go back and you look at the previous leading world economic powers, the financialization is not 
to the degree that we have it, anything that's normal or natural. But you do see it in all the previous leading world economic powers because in their last periods of topping out and, and getting ready to slide, everybody wants to be involved in international services, finance, they don't want any more fishing boats, no more textile industry, no more slag from, from making steel. They want to be doing all these fashionable things that they convince themselves is sort of the new economy which is coming. And several academicians have gone into this, and it's never the new economy that's coming. What, what comes along is the next industrial power. Now, sure, there's going to be a little bit more there in finance, but nothing like what we've seen here. If you go back and you look at the financialization of Britain and Holland, they're both pretty substantial, but not as much as we've seen. The Dutch got themselves into a point where basically all they did was make loans, and ultimately the reason they couldn't keep this working was in the 1760s and 70s. They just had a succession of panics and bankruptcies and crises. You can't run a financial economy. And, you know, we've had that for the last 25 years. You had the crash of 87, then you had the whole SNL thing, then you had the, uh, the Asian currency and the Russian debt, and then the collapsing tech bubble, and now the collapsing housing bubble. You know, and, and they'll tell you that, well, we don't get many recessions anymore. No, because it's just a never-ending financial problem. And a digression I could make here under other circumstances would be to tell you about the GDP numbers, which are, according to some of the experts, uh, essentially Swiss cheese. You can't count on them. And the reason why they're so anxious to keep essentially the GDP up and the CPI down is so that people can be misled. And one of the experts refers to it as Pollyanna creep. And I think that's a great description of our statistics. I mean, how many of you, I don't want to ask for a show of hands, who believes in the CPI? Because I've suggested that if you do, you basically need to go and have an IQ test. Uh, but it's not that that's the only set of numbers that's lousy. Because uh, Obama's chief economic advisor actually wrote a piece for the New York Times at an uh, op-ed page back in 2003 in which he argued that the Bush administration had cooked the books on the unemployment numbers, and he had a, uh, that's true too. Uh, the New York Times had an interesting article on that one just on Sunday. So between the CPI, the GDP, and the unemployment numbers, if you believe all this stuff, you know, I've got this bridge in Brooklyn that you're gonna love. Uh, but if you don't believe them, then what you have to face is that some of this is worse and that people are being gulled and that you can have an economy that would be in recession by the old definitions while they're telling you that you've still got 1.7 or 2.4 percent growth. Uh, but that makes people feel better. It makes them feel like it's their fault, not the government's. And here are all these other people thriving in this, this environment and, and here we are, we're not getting anywhere. Now, historically, the rise of finance like this has always been a bad sign, sort of right at the end. They go too far, and countries generally find themselves pulled down by debt. Now, we are obviously a classic candidate for that sort of problem. Generally speaking, in the previous situations, it's come because debt arose partly from not doing what they used to do that was in the real world, but partly because of too many adventures in foreign policy and too many wars. For those of you who remember history, the Spanish were pulled down by the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century. By the end of it, they were, they were effectively bankrupt. The Dutch by the wars from 1688 to 1713, the British by two world wars. Uh, Anybody here who knows British history, right after World War II, they had to keep food rationing in place for six or seven years. When then Princess Elizabeth married the, the Duke of Edinburgh, and I forget, maybe it was 1949, they, uh, they wouldn't suspend the rationing, but they gave her a lot of extra coupons. 
<laughs> you know, and I'm sure some of the relatives kicked in pheasants from the estates and so forth. But, but nevertheless, I mean, it was serious stuff. The pound sterling had been kicked down from essentially $5 in 1914 to 280 in, in 1949. And anybody who had been foolish enough to own British government debt had taken a total bath. And of course, the, the British, the, the empire had unraveled. The country that had been the leading creditor country in 1914 was the uh, uh, industrial world among the successful countries, the, the biggest debtor by that time. We are, of course, now the world's biggest debtor. We also used to be the world's greatest producer of oil. We are now the world's leading importer of oil. We used to be the world's greatest producer of manufactured goods. We are now the world's leading importer of manufactured goods. So we don't do what we used to do in the same ways or even more strikingly the way the British and the Dutch. Now let me wind down here. I'm not even going to try to get into the oil ties except to say that that's another huge set of problems because oil used to support our dollar and now it's almost a competing currency with gold. And, uh, but in terms of, you raise the question, how can somebody say that a country is moving into this trajectory and that we should take all this stuff seriously? And one of the things that having been involved in politics in the United States for a long time, I remember right after I wrote The Emerging Republican Majority, you had all these problems developing in the global economy. Johnson with Vietnam had major currency problems in 1968. Nixon had them in 69 and 70. They, they closed the gold window. They wouldn't let foreign central banks redeem for gold at that point. Uh, that was, was a major event, and it, it led to a lot of books, uh, the empire in retreat, all that sort of thing. There's a long list of them. There were, there were five or six that got a fair amount of attention. Then after Watergate and the problem in Vietnam, you had another round of uh, America in retreat, sort of the end of America as the great power. Then there was another set in the late 1980s about Japan is going to overtake us. And Paul Sangas of Massachusetts, the senator, when he was running for president, a little too late, he said, World War II was over, Germany and Japan won, because he was talking about their strength economically as opposed to ours, and we were all afraid of the Japanese at that point. Well, it turned out not to be true. Uh, now, is it? I think it is. I, I think, I don't want to get into questions of George W. Bush's candle power, but you know, I, I would say that rarely has a country in trouble had such a totally deficient leader uh, who has also embarked on one of the least successful wars in modern history. And you know, stewardship of the price of oil is also interesting, considering that he and Cheney were former oilmen. You know, we should have put a good humor man in there because if, if you've got two former oil executives who saw the price quintupled while they were supposedly on the job, you would have been better off with a good humor man. You know, he wouldn't have known anything stupid to do. He would have sat there sucking a popsicle. Uh, so we have leadership that ranks with something from, you know, a second-rate banana republic. And... You've got the Democrats running at this point. What is the major purpose of Hillary Clinton in life to portray Barack Obama as an elitist out of sync with small town Pennsylvania? What is his principal thing is to describe Bill Clinton, frankly, as exactly what I think he is. Uh, but that's pretty negative. So that <laughs> you've got this, this fratricide developing there so that it's quite possible that John McCain you know, who said, he didn't quite say it, but he wanted to stay in Iraq for 100 years. Boy, that'd be good for debt. I figure 15 years of Iraq and we're down the tubes like the British. So, you know, he, he doesn't get his whole, he also said he doesn't understand much about economics. You know, not a great advisory at this juncture of American history. So I wish I could say that I was optimistic about all of this and that I didn't think a lot of this was coming down the pike. But 
I, I can't say that. I, it just strikes me as too likely that we're going through one of these periods where the leading world economic power faces a bad 20, 30, 40 years as they sort of are stripped or strip away themselves all these accoutrements of, of empire and currency dominance and the energy regime that dominates the world, we're losing it. And there's really no particular political prospect that you can bet a lot of money on that's just gonna roll that back. And if you do have to go through that 20, 30, 40 years, it's painful as the British could tell you when they were having these awful meals in 1949. I mean, British cooking isn't great anyway, so imagine what it was like when you had food rationing. Uh, I suppose you could say one of the things that could happen to the United States is we could all be eating English cuisine circa 1949. Uh, but I, I really take all this seriously, and it, it's kind of hard for me to, to go out in middle America and, and say this in a particularly upbeat way, and if there's one thing I know about Cambridge, you don't have to always be upbeat. You can, <laughs> you can see a lot of trouble coming down the pike. Yeah. I spent three years here at the Harvard Law School, which I cordially disliked. Um, I could never see the point of the law school, really, if you could take three quarters of the lawyers in the United States and ship them to China, we could head off a rival early. Uh, uh, so anyway, let, let me stop here, and you know, I'll be glad to pick up on your questions or insult another presidential candidate or, or whatever. Thank you. Yeah. You stay there and I can yeah. stay. Do you want to do that? Or do you want to, would you like to sit? Yeah. Okay. We're listening to Kevin Phillips discussing bad money, the global crisis of American capitalism. Kevin, as the moderator, let me ask the first question. Uh, it seems to me that the American economy moved uh, in its uh, long term trajectory from one that was dominated by agriculture to manufacturing, and that uh, your argument is that beginning basically in the 1970s, we've moved from manufacturing f to finance. But given the decrease in competitiveness of the United States because of its high wages and the possibility of low-wage manufacturing overseas, did it have a possibility of doing something else? I think we faced an alternative back in the 1980s of whether or not you might have an attempt made through some industrial strategy or policy to imitate the high value added exporter nations like Germany and Japan and Switzerland, all of which had a considerable financial sector, but it's, it's below the manufacturing sector. Instead, basically what you got, I think, was a determination, and I get into this in, in some length in the book, but Finance was what mattered, so that was what they babied through the Federal Reserve and they bailed out. And it's just too much bailing and too much bubbling for a coincidence. And now we have it and we're sort of stuck with it and it really limits what we can do in terms of saying, hey, well, they got too big and uh, it'll be a good thing if they get busted back to 15 or 16 percent of GDP, which is you know, where they were in, in the 80s. I can't work like that because they're, for better or worse, they're the dominant force and if they really screw it up, as they have been screwing it up, we're gonna get rolled back in a lot of different ways here. But I, I don't agree that, uh, that finance is efficient. One of the things that people have, have argued with is that whereas in the manufacturing era when you would have government programs about 40% uh, of the, the debt would translate into uh, economic growth. Now the calculation is that only something like 15, 16, 18% of the debt translate into economic growth. And I think the reason is pretty simple because the, the debt back in the 80s would be for uh, you know, building aircraft or, or paying teachers or, or what have you, it, it was more real things. And what you've got now, you've got 10,000 hedge funds. And you know, what benefit for anything that matters is gonna come from debt that's created so that hedge funds can make four times as much money because instead of betting $12 million on outcome A, they bet $48 million on outcome A, which produces a, a, a profit of 900,000 instead of you know, 200 and something. Uh, 
uh, this is finance. It isn't efficient for things that matter to average Americans. And I don't think it was a plausible choice, but I'll tell you that choice was never submitted to anybody. And we have a Federal Reserve. It's amazing to me that they talk about making this the all-powerful regulator. The Open Market Committee of the Federal Reserve has bank presidents from the Federal Reserve banks are picked by bankers. You cannot have the money supply of the United States guided by a regulatory body picked by the industry it's supposed to regulate. That's not the way it works. Uh, so I don't think there's anything efficient about finance at this point. I think it's in a lot of ways terribly inefficient. You, you'd get the, the pride in the CDOs that were a big money maker for a lot of these firms two or three years ago, and you get this great description from Alan Greenspan. This is all worthless, you know, we never should have done that. The fellow they just picked to head the uh, Securities Indus and Futures Industry Association it was a fellow I quote in the book is basically saying, gee, we never thought they'd invent things like that. Oh, tell me a joke, you know. <laughs> uh, they'd invent anything that increased profits like these things increased them. You know, labor would do anything that doubled their wages. Manufacturers would do anything that doubled their profits. I'm not singling finance out to say that they're doing something other people wouldn't do. <laughs> Just have, they have the big opportunity. And they took it and they blew it. And they're becoming something of a joke in different countries for different reasons. And it's, that's just a, another whole thing about how we, we've made ourselves look foolish around the world. And the polls show these incredible numbers. Let me ask you one follow-on question, then I'm going to take questions from the audience. Uh, it goes back to the question of regulation. Uh, from 1934 up until the 1970s or even 1980s, America had a financial industry that grew steadily but that was free of the kinds of crises that we have seen in spades in the last 20 years. It wasn't a system just governed by the Fed, it was governed by right. a number of other institutional breaking systems. And we, in addition, from the 1940s, 1945 until the 1970s, had a system in Bretton Woods that also provided a measure of international right. coordination. What of those lessons are lessons for us today? Well, you can't deregulate too much. There's been a gross overindulgence of deregulation. And again, uh, the financial system was trapped into it back in 1980-81 by the inflation level, so they had to get rid of the ceiling on, uh, on interest rates. So you had major deregulation there. The Carter administration was actually a major force in deregulation, then Reagan was too. Uh, than Clinton was. So it's very hard to distinguish between the parties here, much as they'd like to blame it all on the others. And the other thing that I see in all of this, which is, uh, is so discouraging, is you look at the, the growth of all these games, and because there was some interdependence and because Greenspan and others wanted to see assets continue to be accumulated, they wouldn't do anything that they could possibly avoid that would create a crisis. So they'd drop interest rates so they could bail institutions out. If you go back and you look at the, the last periods where we didn't bail out, you get the major downturn in 1969 to 70, where a lot of hedge funds went under, huge degrees of profits were lost, about 100 brokerage firms either went under or were merged and acquired. Uh, and then you go to, let's say, 1980, 81, 82, when Volcker let the interest rates run up to 18%. That was devastating for a lot of investors. And not too many companies and brokerage firms went under, but because it was slow and it was inflation, but it was still devastating. And Business Week had its famous cover in 1982 on the death of equities. Mm -hmm. This was just before the bull market from 82 to 99. So <laughs> what, what was devastated in the U.S. financial economy by the broad destruction of financial firms in 69 and 70 and by the 18% rates? Nothing that mattered. Mm 
But what's being devastated now is that you're turning this country into a Japan in which there's this attempt just to float everything and nobody really has to learn a big lesson except the poor schlumps from Bear Stearns who uh, didn't come out of it too well because the administration was much more interested in taking care of J.P. Morgan Chase for interested reasons. You're well, joining us at Cambridge Forum as we continue our discussion with author Kevin Phillips on his provocative new book, Bad Money, Reckless Finance, Failed Politics, and the Global Crisis of American Capitalism. Let's take some questions from the audience. I was wondering, uh, at this point in time, does the, is there uh, any other choice than to borrow more money and invest it into research development and new manufacturing capacity, new industries, or do, do you see as anything else that could fill this bubble that's been left behind by financing as, as a... I guess if it was up to me, uh, and I could just dictate it, because I'm not sure of the practicalities, but I think we could try to opt, because the dollar declining is good for manufacturing industries. They're getting a little bit of an artificial boost. It's possible that with a combination of a declining dollar and a serious attention to trying to rebuild export industries that you could actually get manufacturing back up to 14, 14 and a half or 15 percent. And you could make a stab at replicating the Swiss or, or a German or Japanese model. I think it's probably too late to do that because we've lost so many capacities that they can't go back. And, they're achieving things in, in industries that remain fairly successful, like chemicals and pharmaceuticals and a number of others, uh, electrical engineering, and taking advantage of those, but they can't replace the things that basically lost out. So I'm skeptical, but I think that's something that could be tried, because clearly as the dollar declines, there is going to be a benefit for uh, exporters of manufactured goods. The, I'd like to say thank you. I, th I think you're a, a prophet in the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. <laughs> and uh, for 20 years, I can't believe I'm paying it much attention to a Republican as I am to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, Overheard uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, the, in your last book, you raised the issue of theocracy. Do you see that as being tempered at all anymore? And then I'd like to have you address the um, possibility that what's been happening is laying a foundation for fascism in the United States. The theocratic aspect I don't take so seriously now. First of all, Huckabee had to uh, ease on that and just do the you know, nice folks type routine. And, but more important in the elections in 2006, you had a religious right you know, pseudo-theocrats on the ballot in, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and they got obliterated. And I would say because of those elections that you don't have to worry about those issues being hyped again the way they were, and that the Republicans not only saw that they, uh, they didn't win, but they saw their what would be called mainline uh, Protestant support really decline. And I know that's true in New England. We now have only one Republican congressman left. Uh, amazing when you think of what part of the country seeded the Republican Party. So I, I don't take that too seriously, well, with the exception if there's another attack. Uh, while George W. was in there, he'd undoubtedly try to make it another good versus evil uh, face off, I don't think it would work, but I think they could try to reprise some of that. And the second part of your question? Do you think that, that we're in laying the foundations oh. for a drift into fascism? Not in the sense that uh, fascism has been analyzed and interpreted. It's essentially been a European and Latin American phenomenon. I don't think it's a good description of what you're going to get out of the English-speaking countries. Far more likely what you would get would be an apple pie authoritarianism with some religious fundamentalism, which is what I guess Bushdom would have liked to become if it could have fulfilled itself. Um, I mean, it, you never go wrong really underestimating George W's uh, larger thought process. I really think that he thought that 
God had picked him to save the country in this period of challenge. Yeah, yeah. And that uh, that was important to him, and that when it didn't work out, I think that's part of why he's sort of, I won't say he's hangdog now, but he doesn't seem to have a lot of assurance left, I think. His whole dream that uh, you know, he was going to be this important person who was playing some role. <laughs> he can't have that now. I don't think so, anyway. Yeah. For at least the last decade, we've been told that globalization is a fait accompli. Uh, it's not true. This observer sees globalization as basically the rule of multinationals and hot money. Uh, do you think that there's still a chance and still a place in the world for enlightened American national sovereignty? Well, I'm not certain exactly what's going to breed this enlightened American national sovereignty, but yes. Uh, the big point I'd make on globalization, and this is not a view that I hold without anybody else, there, there's a small but considerable group of people that think that globalization patterns in the past has been very strongly linked to one of these leading world economic powers hegemony and that it's something that they will do that the Dutch did where they were at the zenith of their global trading capacity. The British stood for globalization in a big way you know, until the World War came along and then all of a sudden globalization wasn't working for them anymore so they, they went to what they called imperial preference which was strengthening the empire, so it was starting to be protectionist. And the 20s and 30s were an interruption of globalization in a big way, because trade contracted. And I think trade is, is going to contract and, and not be what it was in the, next, in the next period, and that you will not have globalization of the sort we saw before until you restore a non-declining leading world economic power. And that one of the things that we've seen in the last two to three years with the growth of the sovereign wealth funds in Asia and with the rise of more and more of the oil businesses in, under the control of state oil companies in third world and, and, and Persian Gulf countries, you're seeing the role of government is resurging. And as the role of government resurges, globalization is not going to increase. Okay. Um I have a really good friend that lives in Germany, and I would love to be able to visit her about the dollar's relative value to the euro is really cost prohibitive for me, and I'm just wondering if you have concern about the value of the dollar relative to other currencies and what you're, project, you know, what you're thinking into the future for that? Well, last year I decided that it would be smarter to put my money in things that were denominated by Canadian dollars and American, and that's worked. Uh, but on the other hand, I think it's, it's too late to be sure of really what the gyrations are going to be in the next six or nine months. I think there's a long-term problem for the dollar that it, it's going to uh, reflect a further downward movement, but will it happen with no interruption over the next six to nine months. I am skeptical about that. As far as what we can do, uh, there are lots of German sections of the United States, you know, that they, they still speak German in parts of Wisconsin, the cheese is terrific. Uh, you know, save the airfare, you know, tell your family to come and meet you in New Glarus, Wisconsin or something and have a cheap trip through Europe. I mean, you really can find Europe in the American Midwest more than you might think. No, I don't have any answer to this, but I'll tell you one thing. The decline of the dollar has made Americans, they are reassured in a perverse way because there are a number of things that profit in the financial statements from the decline of the dollar. For example, if you were an American who'd moved to France and you had a middling income and you were established over there and you had, you'd invested French euros in the American stock market. Well, in, in terms of euros, the American stock market is down by almost 50% from uh, 2002. 
Uh, and you would think it's such an incredible buy. People from Europe, I certainly come to New York, I assume that you get some of them in, in, in Boston too, and they're buying all kinds of stuff, they can't believe it. What they're not buying are American stocks. Even though they're at this incredible bargain basement level, if you're a European, but having the, the dollar decline this much, we see the Dow Jones average and think it stayed up pretty close to where it was in 2000. No, sir, because between inflation and the dollar's decline, you had a major dip. And I don't know what's going to reverse this. I just wouldn't be too sure of what the dollar's vicissitudes are going to be in the next six to nine months. Hi, um, I just want to say um, I'm a big fan and thank you very much. Um, it's been fun watching your uh, progression through the years. Um, it used to drive me crazy hearing you on the radio in the 70s, but increasingly in the last few years hearing you on the radio is increasingly terrific. But anyway, I have kind of two questions. One is, um, my mom used to work for an insurance company in Hartford. That's where I grew up. And Hartford is part of the financial system, insurance. and. She used to uh, administer pension funds, and they decided they were going to get out of that. And I went to visit her, and she was the last person left in this department, half of a floor empty. The other half of the floor was taken up by this brand new, huge, walled-in glass space with all these screens and everything. And I realized, Wall Street, they're going from pensions to gambling. So, I, I mean, listening to your talk about the financialization of the country, I think it's more to it than that. I think it's not just financialization, but a, but a move from financial structures that used to be much more conservative to gambling. Well, what they want to do basically is force as much money into private markets as possible. So the preference is that the companies can afford uh, defined benefit pension uh, agreements anymore where they commit to providing a certain amount of money. Now what they want you to do is essentially put your money in a 401k so that whatever is left is what you get and they're not held responsible for a defined benefit payable 15, 20 years out. Uh, this is the, the conservative opportunity society which, you know, again, if you believe that, I've got a bridge. Uh, basically, what it represents is the sense that the free market can do better. Now, there are times when the free market does better. I don't think this is one of them. And in consequence, the whole notion of privatizing pensions so that people are forced to take care of their own money, well, it's very hard to take care of money. And, and plenty of people that have plenty of education and then plenty of money don't take great care of it, but pushing the ordinary American whose idea of, of investments is maybe he's got $6,400 in some mutual fund somewhere, but that doesn't mean you can handle all these decisions and make these choices. But essentially the private financial sector would, would like that money to be pushed into private investments. But it seems to me that there used to be more of a tradition of leadership in this country, not just in the political sphere, but oh, also, in the, that's right. also in the corporate sphere, being well, more responsible. Yes. And now it seems to have been taken over by rampant careerism, right. Condoleezza Rice possibly being one of them. Oh, I don't know whether she's a careerist. I mean, she's, she's George Bush's foreign policy mommy. But since you know a lot of these powers that be... She explained to him how you spell Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think... What do you think is going to be the solution to this? You know, I think your, the corporations are not going to be able to dump health and pension responsibilities the way they have, because one of the things that Greenspan and Bernanke and Paulson have all said recently is corporations are really in a very, very good cash position right now. They, they've done quite well. Profits have been high. They may not be as good in the future, but I think the era of corporations being allowed just to ditch all these things because it'll be better to push them into the, the marketplace is not going to wash. Now, how much you can restore of the, the old obligation, I don't know. Uh, certainly the Democrats have not made much of an issue out of this. 
they don't make much of an issue out of anything because they want the second biggest checks. Basically, you know, the Republicans can have the bigger check. And now, actually, the Democrats are getting the bigger checks. So, you know, watch out. Uh, because you can't assume if they're getting the big checks that uh, they're going to be uh, dusting off the Franklin D. Roosevelt picture. <laughs> uh, there was a, an article in the, in the Times on March 23rd, which uh, has... Uh, the uh, growth of, I think, credit derivative swaps growing from $900 billion in 2001 to $45.5 trillion in, uh, as of uh, 2007 or 8. Uh, I, I, my question is, if the, the level of debt is something like $53 trillion, or f what, $50, 50 trillion, dollars, I think is what you put it at, and the GDP is about 13 or 13.5 right. trillion dollars. What do these 45 trillion dollars of, 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 of swaps, <laughs> how do they figure in? Well, there are 500 trillion dollars worth of derivatives, of all derivatives, but that's a larger group. Credit swaps, credit default swaps is their actual name. They have just grown like topsy. And now they're starting to worry that uh, previously they figured the notional amount doesn't matter because you've got two sides on it and they cancel each other out for the most part. But that's not necessarily true because they're not going to cancel each other out if one of the counterparties is insolvent. Then the other counterparty uh, lacks recourse and so you've got a double whammy there. Well, they forgot to figure that one out. You know, uh, If these people had been manufacturing serious machinery, they'd be in jail. But because they're manufacturing this paper crap, they're not in jail. Uh, I don't know how you solve that problem. I mean, they, they sent the uh, head of the New York Stock Exchange to jail back in the mid-1930s. Uh, you would think that there'd be some hot contenders uh, uh, from some of the architects of this, but I don't think so because the the deregulation and the permissiveness and everything, it, it makes it unlikely. But I have no idea what's going to happen with all those derivatives. And this is where, if you want to read what the International Monetary Fund and the Bank for International Settlements and some of the other crowds that are getting nervous, uh, they're starting to think you're going to have some serious numbers coming out of the derivatives mess. And what they are, nobody quite knows, but you had Bill Gross of PIMCO, Pacific uh, uh, Income Management, very well-known uh, bond manager, and he predicted that $250 uh, billion dollars worth of credit default swaps would uh, sour. It's probably an underestimate, because that was two or three months ago. We've come to the end of our broadcast hour, so on behalf of everyone here and our listening audience, let me say thank you. Kevin Phillips, thank you very much. You've been listening to a program of the Cambridge Forum recorded in April 2008, co-sponsored by the Lowell Institute, the First Parish in Cambridge, Unitarian Universalists, and the Friends of Cambridge Forum. For more information about this radio program entitled Bad Money, The Global Crisis of American Capitalism featuring Kevin Phillips and about our ongoing radio series, visit us on the web at cambridgeforum.org. In Harvard Square, I'm Richard Parker. Thank you all for joining us.